Good morning to all, and welcome to the Institut uh, Francais for this uh, exceptional rendezvous, which is part of the uh, Freeze Art Fair program, and that we are very happy to uh, co-organize with the British Council. Clearly, I mean, over the last 18 months, we've been through a very difficult, you name, you name them, uh, times. Um, but over the last few days, over the last few weeks, uh, it was great to uh, rediscover the consolation, uh, and not only the consolation, but also the, the great and positive energy that arts bring in our lives. With the freeze, with many exhibitions going on everywhere in London, with the FIAC also coming up in, uh, in Paris, uh, it's, uh, it's a great moment and there is this great effervescence again. Today's event is a celebration in many ways. We are celebrating arts, we are celebrating those who live through arts, those who make it, those who do arts, and those who love and support arts. We are celebrating two great artists, and I'm very happy and very excited to, uh, about this conversation uh, today. Uh, dear Sonia, dear uh, Zineb, dear Jilane, thank you for uh, accepting our, uh, our invitation. We are very much looking forward to uh, hearing your, your, your vision. Sonia and uh, Sonia Boyce and Zineb Sedira will uh, represent, respectively, uh, Great Britain and France to the forthcoming Venice uh, Biennial. Uh, today we won't be talking too much about the specific of their, their projects because they are under uh, embargo. They are, uh, we won't be breaking any secrets, uh, but we'll be, uh, there are lots to talk about. And today we will also celebrate the uh, intensity of the artistic relation between France and, uh, and the UK. And I can't think of a better illustration of this intensity than the Fluxus Arts uh, project. Uh, it's a program that we have set up 10 years ago and that we run here at the Institute together with the support of many institutions and notably the, the British Council. Uh, and over the last 10 years, we've been supporting more than 250 artists uh, and uh, about 230 venues. Uh, and so we've brought closer uh, French and, and British artists over the years. Any relation you would know needs attention and care, and uh, at the Institute and, to, and together with our British partners, we are making sure that we will continue to explore all the ways to strengthen and to preserve this uh, relationship. If you ask me, I think it's not a coincidence that France and the United Kingdom uh, chose uh, such great artists as uh, Zineb and, 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 and Sonia. Of course, the processes were completely separate. They have their own, uh, it's, two, it's two very different uh, processes. And the juries couldn't know that you are bound, dear Zineb, dear Sonia, by such a long-standing friendship that you lived in, in the same street in Brixton uh, for, for about 10 years, and that you have so much uh, in, in common, of course, with your own words, with your own words, and uh, with your own media. Uh, but you, both of you, you confront very much head-on with the press, pressing issues of, uh, of the word. Um, both of you, I think you, you underline that identity can only rhyme with diversity. Both of you, you believe also in, the, in collaboration, in cooperation, uh, through uh, designing your, 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 your arts. Uh, and you believe, obviously, both of you in the transformative uh, power of, uh, of, of art. So we're very much looking forward to, uh, to, to, to listening to, to you. Um, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful morning, and I invite now our dear uh, partner, the British Council, Emma Dexter, uh, for like an introductory uh, word. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. Um, my name is Emma Dexter. I'm Director of Visual Arts at the British Council. And I have the great pleasure of being responsible for the British Council Commission at the British Pavilion in Venice. Um, so firstly, uh, I want to say a big thank you to the Institut Francais for hosting this wonderful event today. Um, in particular, to Bertrand Buschwalter, the director, and also Isabel Mancy, head of visual arts here. Um, and also to all of you, um, such a wonderful um, and um, really um, full audience for coming. Um, I also want to offer my profound thanks to Sonia and Zineb for giving us this insight into their thoughts as they prepare for their respective exhibitions, and to Jelaine Tawadros, our esteemed chair this morning. Um, 
I think this event represents the very best of us, two remarkable artists whose work reminds us who we are, who we want to be, and where we come from. And I hope bringing us together in a spirit of friendship, exchange, and deep reflection. The work of both of these artists inspires hope by demonstrating the importance of working together to find solutions. This event itself also sends a powerful message. The Institut Francais and the British Council working together to deepen and strengthen artistic ties between the UK and France, building on the wonderful example of the Fluxus co collaboration that Bertrand has already mentioned. We have Zineb to thank for suggesting this discussion, which I hope will continue in many other forms in future. Um, but I think, as far as we know, there has never been a conversation of this kind between the artist representing France and the artist representing the UK. Um, any historians out there, please do correct us if we've got that wrong. Um, amongst many friends of the British Council here today, I can see key figures involved with Sonia's exhibition who I would like to thank. Emma Ridgway, our Shane Ackroyd Associate Curator for the British Council Commission, and Shane himself has so generously made a leadership gift to create the post. And also Mikolai Sakutovich and Shelby Sue from Terme Art, who are our intrepid partners on the British Council Commission over the past four years. I also want to say thank you to Simon Lee Gallery, who was so instrumental in this project and who we couldn't be more grateful to, particularly Simon and Georgia Lurie. And we'd also like to thank the Henry Moore Foundation who have come on board so early in the project. I also want to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to our respective teams working on the show, both Sonia's in her studio and ours at the British Council. Thank you all so much for the contributions that you're making to make the 2022 edition of the Biennale de Venezia a huge triumph. And now thank you for listening and over to the panel. Bonjour et bienvenue à l'Institut français pour cet événement très spécial qui réunit deux nations, deux missions culturelles et deux artistes extraordinaires en conversation. Mes chers remerciements à Petron, à Emma et à la tâche culturelle Isabelle Monsi et son équipe pour la réalisation de cette collaboration unique. Good morning and welcome to the Institut français for this very special event which brings together two nations, two cultural missions, and two extraordinary artists in conversation together. My warm thanks to Bertrand, to Emma, uh, and to Isabelle Monsi, the cultural attaché, and her team for organizing this unique collaboration. I'm really delighted to be here today with two very special artists whom I admire hugely, and whom I'm proud to say have been friends for over 30 years. Um, I'm sure neither of them need any introduction, but I will do a short intro <laughs> because I've been asked to do so um, to both of them and their work. I'll keep it brief. So um, Zainab was born in Paris, but has lived and worked in London for several decades. Zainab's practice ranges across film, photography, sculpture and installation. And her early works took inspiration from her personal history as a French Algerian woman to explore themes of intergenerational histories and experiences of diaspora. These artistic investigations have led her to develop an expansive practice which raises questions about movement and mobility, memory and transmission, as well as environmental issues through works which are both poetic and lyrical. The archive in all its forms, from all history to fragments of film to documentary photography, play a critical role in Zainab's work, frequently, um, which frequently confronts the disjuncture between past and present and resists the imposition of official narratives, activating stories and voices that have often been suppressed. Sonia was born in London, where she's lived and worked throughout her career. Sonia is Professor of Black Art and Design at the University of Arts London, and has taught fine art studio practice for over 30 years in several art colleges to many artists. Sonia's early practice, large-scale multimedia works, 
investigated uncomfortable questions about race, gender, and colonial histories. Her practice over the past years has encompassed a variety of media, including drawing, print, photography, video, and sound. With an emphasis on collaboration and collaborative work, Sonia has been working closely with other artists since 1990, producing works which often involve improvisation and spontaneous performance by her collaborators. In her explorations of the intercies between sand and memory and the dynamics of space and spectatorship, Sonia's works frequently deploy dissonance and disruption as a means to interrupt and reframe how we see the world. So our conversation today, <laughs> I hope, will be as broad-ranging. Um, Sonia and Zainab, as has been said, have been friends for almost 30 years. The three of us have been friends for about that long, too. So I thought perhaps we could start with a conversation about friendships, and particularly about artist friendships. And there are lots of famous artist friendships. Um, Picasso and Braque, who Braque uh, characterized as being like two mountaineers linked together. Helen Frankenthaler and Grace Hartigan, fellow abstract expressionists who forged a very deep and lasting friendship in what was an overwhelming male movement of American abstract expressionists. Um, Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, maybe closer to home, Chris Ophelia and David Ajay, who both studied at the Royal College and went on actually to collaborate in Venice Biennale in 2003. Um, on a sort of joint work, in a way, um, in the British Pavilion. Perhaps, Sonia, you'd like to start talking about your friendship with Zainab. Um, we were, I, I don't know if that is my, yeah, I can hear it now. Um, yeah, we were trying to reminisce a bit earlier, and I think that we first met uh, in Brixton around 1993. Um, at the time, I was in um, Brixton Housing Co-op, and so was Zineb, and um, I was pregnant with my first child, Maya, who's here. Um, and uh, yeah, our conversation started really about housing more than about being artists, and then very quickly realised that we were that we were both artists, and that um, I don't know we we just kind of really clicked. Uh, I don't know what you would like to kind of what your recollections are. Yeah, I mean, also, I think I had some tutorial with you. Also, at the, was it at the Slade at Central Saint, uh, Saint Martins? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the first time actually we met mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. when you came and taught us. And um, although we were the same age, and I was I was an old student at the time, I wasn't um, what they call a mature student at the time. But uh, yeah, and then we were living in Brixton, so yeah. that was amazing. And then and then we lived in the same street for like ten years or more. Yeah, we were and our next door neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. And our children would play together. I mean, I remember spending time with David uh, at the one o'clock club uh, across the road <laughs> with Maya and Ali, my son Ali and Maya, uh, Sonia's daughter, playing together. So, yes, there was this connection of through housing, but not only, because we also set up the Black Women Artist Group yeah. in 96. 96, You yeah. and I and another yeah. group of where we will meet once a month. Once a month. And, we, I mean, the aim of that was to actually, because we'd begun t to talk about work and wanting to have more conversations with other black women artists about, to specifically talk about their work. Um, because there wasn't, there was no, there was no place really uh, other than us creating it ourselves. So uh, yeah, Zineb and I, we would kind of, we hatched this plan, we'd set up a bank account and <laughs> everybody put in a bit of money so that we could organize to meet in the women's center and just show each other our work and, and someone would give a, uh, a presentation then we'd have a discussion. But we ran that for a few years. Yeah, yeah. And I remember one of the poignant conversation that we had at the time and I was really, amazed by, by your, your commitment to, to these kind of uh, groups and discussion is that there was, although it was called Black Women Group, as we know, we didn't meant black women with black skin only to be in the group. There was, of course, different range of, of, of people, but I don't know if you remember the, a the, big discussion the, about that. the Serbian lady who was in the group with us for, for, um, for you and for now, it wasn't a problem that she was a member of the group, but it raised a lot of a question where people were thinking she was almost too white to be in the group. 
And then Sonia was adamant, and you were great like that, where you actually say it's not about the color of skin, it's about experience, and, or colonial experience, or, or, or racist experience. So it's not just about, and I remember us having to kind of have this conversation, and this conversation mind blown me, because I was still kind of quite, as opposed to you, I was still quite young in terms of dealing with this issue of identity, and you were already had already, you know, you were part of the black um, uh, art movement, and you know, you had a bit more experience. In, and I learned so much from you, Aww. so much. And I would say thanks to Franz Fanon, I was accepted in the group because Franz Fanon was uh, was uh, you know, or became Algerian, mm -hmm. and uh, and also had a huge importance in the history of of uh, or identity politics in in England, yeah. as in France. Nobody, nobody ever spoke about Franz Fanon, ever, at the time. Of course, it's different now. So for me, um, I've learned so much from you, Sonia. I don't, I don't know if you realize that from you and David being neighbors also, having political or, or very interesting chat, you know, with the kids. It was just kind of, you know, amazing. And that really kind of uh, infiltrated in my, in, in my work. You know. I mean, it does have to be said also in, in terms of Brixton that there was a very strong kind of creative community there. Not that everything was happening in Brixton, but mm -hmm. that there were so many people that were, you know, kind of uh, cultural activists who were going out there and doing stuff. And I mean, we are of the generation of just get up and do it. And if you need it, you do it yourself, yeah. kind of. Uh, so, you know, the, the whole question about doing, um, making a group happen, having these discussions, reading texts, yeah. arguing about arguing about positions was yeah. something that was not only happening through me, but was happening yeah. in the kind of a slightly wider cultural uh, yeah. community. And we were having already this discussion through the Brixton Cup, where there was already a question about, you know, um, you know, how to rehouse, who to rehouse, you know, racism within housing, all those issues were already very prominent. And we all know that uh, in the 60s and 70s, Brixton was a hub of, you know, or one of Quite the hub of the ac activism, you know, um, um, uh, militant activi activism at the time. And then, of course, there was a riot of Brixton that was just coming in London just after that. So there was a, all those legacies coming through living in Brixton. And, and yeah, and we were part of that much later in my case, but yeah. You've beautifully uh, taken us to the next question and area I want to talk about because, and I'm glad you talk about Franz Fanon because um, you know, one of the things that's extraordinary about Fanon's writing is the way that he moves from the personal, the epistemological, and the, the physical, unique individual body and experience to thinking about a broader collective and political agenda. And I wonder if we could move from the question of friendship in the sense of the private, intimate link between individuals to the question of solidarity, um, and, which is kind of more public, more politically orientated notion of shared interests and alliances, which you just both began touching on. And both of you, you've spoken about the group that you set up together, but you've both also through your practice and your activism, also been engaged. Sonia, you in your groundbreaking work around the archives and histories of black British artists, I'm thinking here about the African and Asian Visual Artists Archive, the extraordinary black modernism research um, that you shaped at UAL, um, which has brought to public attention so many artists and histories that were kind of invisible. Um, and Zainab, your work, your archival research, which I touched on earlier, which has kind of unearthed so many extraordinary connections between uh, political struggle and artistic creativity, but also connections, transnational connections, between uh, activists and artists uh, in, the, in the world. So I wonder if you could say something both of you about kind of the idea of solidarity and, and the role of the artist? Um, I, I suppose I would probably begin by thinking about my experience in art school. Um, so I was studying late 70s, early 80s, um, and uh, I found it incredibly difficult and lonely being at art school in that there were very few examples of, of, uh, of artists that I could 
recognise as being, you know, I suppose, specifically of African diasporic um, practice, except for in very, very, very limited instances that might be to do with perceived ideas of primitivist work. Uh, and so, for me, going back to 1982, when I, I suddenly discovered that there were hundreds of artists uh, around the country through going to the Wolverhampton um, conference that was set up by students uh, that became known as the Black Art Group, and entering, you know, entering an auditorium with 200 other people and more, uh, and thinking, there's so much, and you know, you mentioned unearthing, that there was so much that I was completely unaware of. Uh, at, but in my, in my context within the art school, was like, how do I not know about all these people? So I think that, that, that need to connect was the very first um, point for me in terms of um, thinking, oh, I, I, you know, there's something there that I really, there's something over there that I really need to be part of, that I really need to understand, that's kind of calling me. It's like a kind of magnet, you could say. Uh, and I do think the question about unearthing is part of that process of solidarity. Well, I must say that I was perhaps a bit more lucky than you because when I did, when I went to art college, it was in the 90s already. And, uh, and people like you, and Mona Hatoum, Suta Pabishwa, and many, many others were teaching me, you know. Um, and so I had, I was lucky to have this wealth of experience. Um, in my case, I did feel sometimes lonely because I was French and Algerian, and although there was a lot of connection between the immig immigrant history uh, of Britain and French one, there was also differences because I was also Arab of Muslim background, um, so it kind of made it slightly different. But yeah, I think for me, my, 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 my moment of solidarities or communities were through the people I met, like you and, and many others, and, and all those groups we formed, and all those places we went, and, and also going to a talk exhibition to always try to be present and to show support. Um, and it's funny when you look at it now, you see that things have moved on so much. I'm not saying it's perfect, far from that, but it's moved on so much. But at the time, there was this sense of solidarity. A friend of you was showing somewhere and making some kind of a political work. You had to be there. You, had, you know, we had kids, so of course it was always complicated organizing babysitting, especially imagine you and David wanted to be there also. You know, in my case, I was a single mother at the time. So. But we did it, we just kind of did it. And also Villa Road was great because we would kind of babysit each other, kids and, and whatever. So yeah, so we made sure to be present and to, to, to show yeah, a warmth and a solidarity in terms of, of, of the ideas and, and yeah. And oh, I, I mean, I do think also there was that question of, you know, you, you, know, you mentioned that the work might be really political and the kind of need to find connections with people who could articulate a certain kind of experience you know and I think yeah. for me that's what was driving you know the what I call this kind of magnet people being drawn to a certain moment a certain kind of context and out of that solidarity and interpersonal relationships of course they then yeah. develop and the discussion about you know what is urgent yeah. you know what do but we I mean I think about? Iniva was a great example at the time that was really the place where we would all meet and we all actually discuss this issue whether it was at an opening or through a conference or, or through catalogues because Iniva was producing some excellent uh, catalogues at the time or, or books or publication so for me yeah that was really to sh to be there I needed to be there and surrounded by people who kind of felt and, and felt or had similar experiences or and and you're right and we were articulating it in a way that i wasn't able to do at the time you know and perhaps I've, i hope i've learned to do better now i think this is a really important point which perhaps gets forgotten that in the early 90s we were actually pre-internet but also that there was very little written mm. about the work of black artists and so in a way, the way that I got to know you both was because in the absence of any work, any writing, you had to write the work. You had to do the work of writing and articulating and contextualizing because no other source or material existed. And I wonder if you could um, say something about the, about the shift between that moment with that kind of absence of a kind of discourse and now 
where, in a sense, there is an overabundance in some way of writing and contextualization of work, sometimes not always in the way that... Sometimes it cuts across an artist's intentionality or potentially also closes down certain possibilities of reading or writing about work. I mean, I think, yeah, there's, there, there, there are lots of things there that, uh, that you're saying, Jelaine. And of course, we should also add that, you know, we, we first started talking in the 1980s, you coming to interview me. Uh, we were just talking earlier on about you, you transcribing what you have on a cassette, you know, vinyl cassette, onto something digital as a, uh, as a way of kind of um, leapfrogging into the 21st century with that material. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the results of uh, that really vibrant um, fermenting moment of the 80s into the 90s, one of the unexpected um, results of that is that certain things get projected onto uh, an artist, uh, and an, ex an expectation of what that artist will be doing and what that work will be saying and so there's been there's been uh, I think we're in the midst of a uh, of a, a way in which the art practice is someone we don't have to automatically imagine that the work in you know visualizes them mm -hmm. you know that somehow that artists can speak about what they see in the world or what they're experiencing of the world, rather than somehow having a mirror on themselves to say, "Well, actually, I am the work." And I think there's been, I think there's been quite a shift um, in that sense, but also a kind of pressure for a lot of um, uh, artists that have emerged since the '90s about, you know, are you seen? Are you representing yourself in the work, or are you allowed to speak from your position about the world? For me, that this is a very important shift. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with you that the pressure is less, uh, and I can talk also about that pressure, especially because I had also another life somehow, me, where I was also participating in a lot of exhibition to do with the African diaspora, and then uh, the Arab diaspora, the Middle Eastern diaspora. So I was kind of always uh, demand, I mean, asked to participate in those exhibitions because of the, type and the, the work I was doing. And obviously when you were asked to participate in those exhibitions, there was an expectation of the type of work you should be making, which would be about identity politics, about gender politics, about, uh, you know, racism, colonialism, etc., etc. So, yes, yeah, you're totally right. There is not at all um, this expectation. And I'm, I don't know, in my case, it's because I just got more experience now and I can say no to that more easily than at the time. But at the time, there was, yeah, really this pressure of if you wanted to survive in this art world, <clears throat> you needed to make this type of work. And uh, I can see now a lot of artists from the same background as mine do things that have nothing to do with Algeria or, or being French or whatever, and they're doing very well, and that's great. That's, that's really... Um... But it's an interesting dilemma, you yeah. know. It's like, you're, in a way, one's asked to, to kind of make a decision or how, the, how one navigates uh, the projected image onto oneself as well as, you know, the reason why you, you're making work, or the reason, or what the what the what the impulses to make work are, um, and navigating the art world and art criticism and discussions with other artists, it's like you know one's always kind of yeah, not treading a fine line, but trying to navigate what are the expectations and what do I want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I suppose underpinning all that, you know, is something that Edouard Glissant talks about very uh, articulately, which is the notion that certain subjectivities are seen to be closed and personal and unique, and others open up to the universal. And I think it's this question about how one can speak from a particular space and location, and that specificity can open up to series of universal concerns so that any audience, anyone engaging with the work can also have a conversation with that work and with those ideas. But it doesn't mean that you have to deny, you know, there doesn't have to be a denial within that relationship, you know, exactly. and one, one doesn't have to, 
um, you know, that, that, for instance, that I or, or, or Deneb might speak of a certain experience of the world that many people can identify with, but does, that doesn't obliterate our own position within it. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or it doesn't have to be obvious as well. Mm -hmm. This leads me on, I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and improvisation, um, which both of you deploy as modus operandi in your work. And I'm thinking, Zeynab, in some of the earlier works, um, you know, you worked with members of your family, and then later on you've been working with a range of other people. I'm thinking of, for example, Guardian des Images, where you worked with um, Safia Kouassi, the elderly widow of an Algerian photojournalist, uh, who was herself also a freedom fighter. And Sonia, um, last time you were showed in Venice, which in Okwe's uh, edition of the Venice Biennale, and you presented Exquisite Cacophony, where you had two performers um, working together, a, um, a rapper, Astronolis, and the wonderful vocalist, Elaine Michener. So I wondered if you could both say something, perhaps Zinab first, a little bit about collaboration and improvisation and, and why that's important to you um, in your practice? I mean, the way uh, my, my collaborative work is very different from Sonia in the sense that mine comes through interviews and filming people and making them speak or listening to their stories and then, and then deploying the stories, you know, by various means, whether it's photography, film, uh, etc. I've never really worked Apart from, I can say perhaps with actors, but again, it's different because I were in the film, but I've never done performances or, or projects where I'm actually uh, engaging or making groups of people engaging with each other in front of an audience. So I, in some way, I don't see myself really as working like that. Um, having said that, I really enjoy human contact. For me, it's extremely important in my work. I think you have seen you know, a lot of the work, especially the one with my family, Okay, there was a point where I couldn't use my family anymore because I use them so much. So, uh, and then, you know, the attraction also for older people. So all my interviews we, with people of a certain generation carrying a certain history and, and stories. Um, and, and for me, it's extremely important because I'm in a position of listening um, to some great stories, great people, you know. And, and in that sense, yeah, there is a kind of a, a form of collaboration because you need, when you interview somebody, it's especially if you want to make an art film rather than a documentary, you have to deploy some strategies to, to make the person speak, to, 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 to direct the person to what you want them to say, etc., etc. And that's, I mean, that comes naturally now for me, I think, I hope. But uh, yeah, in that sense, there is a, a huge deal of work that is done before that, which is to do with warm friendship, you know, um, and uh, yeah, and that's it. But um, yeah, I, I haven't, you know, I, I wish I could and I'd like to, and perhaps, perhaps the closest project where I might be um, working with an audience is when I made uh, The Living Room as a Jeu de Pomme uh, two, two years ago, but that was for people to come and join and sit and touch the artwork rather than actually, you know, and whatever they were doing within that space was up to them. But it was an invitation for people to be there in the space. Um, that was the closest, I think, to, to the kind of participation, collaboration I've done. But it was fascinating, uh, Jeu de Pomme, seeing how people interacted, in a sense, changed the work by yeah. interacting with it or um, being attracted to different aspects of the work and having conversations around it within yeah. the institution. And interacting with very, very personal objects, personal objects that belong to me and my children and for many years. For people who don't know, so Zina uh, recreated her front room, her living room, in the galleries within the Jeu de Pomme. And you actually transported your own furniture to the museum yeah. and had to get some substitute furniture to sit on it. Yeah. Home. Yeah. Sonia. Um, so I, I'm, I, I'm thinking particularly, actually, of uh, the influence of your writing, Jelaine. Uh, Jelaine uh, wrote a, a, a monograph about my work in the mid-late 90s, um, a book called uh, Speaking in Tongues. And um, 
it kind of the book came at a moment when I I'd been teaching it. I was teaching at uh, Goldsmiths, and we were having lots of conversations about what's now called a kind of relational practice. Um, and in in your book and, and kind of reading it uh, during the proofing, um, you introduced me to the work of Lydia Clark via Guy Brett. Um, and I somehow there was a kind of uh, something serendipitous because uh, uh, some of the things that I was making at that moment uh, to do with hair, to do with people coming and touching the hair and making objects available for others to interact with, uh, you led me down a path of, of thinking about Lydia Clark and um, and the ways in which Lydia Clark, you know, I'm particularly fascinated with the work that she did with the students in Paris at the Sorbonne where you know they would start with very simple materials and they would just see where it would go. So for me, the the questions that have arisen about working with others, um, that have uh, the question about spontaneity, not knowing where something's going, um, this is very counter to the way that I was taught at the end of at the end of the seventies, which was very very informed by very firm conceptual models you say what the work's going to do and then you follow it and it's almost a work in a kind of antithesis of that of maybe setting a frame but not knowing what's where the work is going to go but it was literally through through you introduced me to Lydia Clark that the work has gone along that particular path of just exploring what happens between people and things and the relation the social relations and the dynamics of what happens when people are in a given situation and they have to figure it out and what do they do with each other uh, and with the things that are uh, a kind of almost like the, the again the magnets that draw them to that space it strikes me that there's an extraordinary well it has struck me for a long time there's an extraordinary openness and generosity uh, in both of your ways of working. Also something which is also quite risky uh, about that opening up of that space. And I wondered if we could talk a little bit about sort of the intersection between space and time in your work, without getting into interplanetary conversations, but or maybe we could, uh, but thinking more really about how, um, you know, Time, as I see it in your practices, is not necessarily linear, but rather circular and expansive and extends over a long durée. And from my perspective, that comes out of, a, of what I would call a diasporic sensibility and modality, uh, which for me is, is radical uh, in, this, in the way in which it uh, opens up um, different possibilities of seeing and understanding the world. I wonder if you could uh, say something about that. Um, one, one of the things that I am... Um, I've been thinking about very recently, um, and of course this is in, in part to do with the, uh, the wave of discussions that have emerged since the, the killing of... Uh, George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matter, the question about Colston, um, is that the, there is, we, we seem to be in a, a kind of, I, I, I'm trying to think of another word besides stasis, kind of in suspension around the traumas of slavery and colonialism and empire building and its aftermath. And I, I keep seeing it in a lot of, of, of work um, at the moment and just feeling, oh, you know, what is this moment that we're in that we, we are, it feels like there's been a kind of collapse of time between, you know, what may have happened 200 years ago and the ramifications of it now. Um, so that's me thinking about a lot of work that I've been seeing and um, it's like it won't let go of us, rather than we won't let go of it. And I, you know, and I do think that that the 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 remnants or the ghosts of those traumatic experiences definitely inform our practices 
um, that we're trying to work through, you know, how at the various the various effects of it, and how we, how can we articulate that through some visual means, through some dialogues, through some um, through making objects, because we are we seem to be caught within. So this question of going back and forth between time is already inherent in that trauma. Um, and of course, the whole modern modernist project is also trapped in that time, uh, that time traveling, you could say. Um, in terms of thinking about going backwards and forwards in time, I think, and this is why, you know, doing the work with Arva, doing the work with the Black Women Artists Study Group, doing the work with um, the Black Artists and Modernism Project, trying to find a, find a, find locations where one can sit and feel oh yeah i can i can understand a bit of me all of those things require going backwards and forwards in time unearthing as you as you you know kind of mentioned right at the beginning um, we can't just be in now we didn't create ourselves i suppose is what um, this question about time kind of asks i mean as you know, Julian, I've been uh, working and researching for quite some time now through the archives, 1960s and 70s, and all those kind of uh, what we call third worldist, tiermondist groups, movement, militant group, um, groups of the time. And um, f it, it was quite interesting to think that, okay, at one point there was a lot of things going on. In the 60s, 70s, of course, a lot of countries were decolonizing themselves through war or through treaties with the colonial powers. And, you know, so there was also this amazing kind of um, uh, energy uh, put towards um, uh, trying to go beyond uh, the colonial, uh, and, and we called it the post-colonial, but we know that it's not even a, a, an appropriate word now anymore to use. But I was wondering whether all those groups that you've set up in the 80s, 90s, and all the exhibition that kind of um, to do with Africa, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that happened, whether it's not uh, in some ways it, it's... Um, what the word, a continuation of perhaps this movement of the 60s and 70s, because it is true that at, to a certain level it did fall in the 60s and 70s, but there is a resurgence, and until the politics are what they are, whether it's in France or in Britain or, or anywhere else, we will always come back to those issues. So it's always catching up with us, even if we won't somehow let go of it. I know in my case, sometimes I'm thinking I'm gonna do a piece of work that is perhaps less personal and less political, but then something happened in the news in the UK or in France that makes me think, no, I've got to do it. I still need to work on this. I still need to have this dialogue with an audience because it's still there. The, the problems are still there. And, uh, and in my case, it feels like I'm going to be on track all my life because I don't think the politics will change in a way that I feel is satisfactory. So I will carry on doing the work, and it's a bit of, like a, a, a bit of a fight. But you know, at least we're doing it through art, and you know, and and the, and, and the conversation is still continuing between us artists, but also you know, with an audience. I, I, and I, I suppose I, I would add that I think that somewhere within what we're talking about, there is this question of fighting amnesia, mm. because of course you know. We do see lots of things about the 60s and the 70s and, you know, uh, but then we don't see certain narratives mm -hmm. or, we, you know, th that things that may have happened in the 30s and 40s here in the UK, around different parts of the world, it takes us that we have to go back through that journey of unearthing to reconnect a history that hasn't really been um, fermented as a kind of within uh, what I would call the collective consciousness, not just the collective unconscious. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree, yeah. We're in an interesting moment, aren't we? Because um, in the wake of Black Lives Matter and the murder of George Floyd, you know, museums, galleries, institutions are very alert to questions of decolonization. I think we, we still need to mm -hmm. understand why, what we all mean by that term, but the term decolonization and are attentive to narratives um, that previously perhaps had been less visible um, within those institutions. 
At the same time, though, we're seeing a backlash and uh, an attempt to push back against what's characterized as wokeness and in what's also, you know, a ghastly expression, culture wars, um, which is um, sort of a desire to, you know, push back against um, the legacies of, or the re-emergence or re-unearthing of the legacies of slavery and colonialism. So I, I, I worry sometimes because, you know, we've, We've been here before in moments when there is an alertness, shall we say, around cultural institutions and politics around race and colonialism and empire. And then, you know, that arc <laughs> moves away and um, those things once again become sublimated. Um, but I feel now there are politicians who are very alert to the power of culture and its, its potential for radical change. Um, I wonder what, how you see this moment and where, if any, if you think your practice, how this will impact on your practice. Wow, good question. Um. I'm actually, I'm actually thinking about, uh, many people may or may not know, the project that I did in Manchester Art Gallery, uh, which is really, the project's called Six Acts, but it's only ever really talked about in terms of the, the removal of a painting, Hylas and the Nymphs. Um, and the, the, you know, the overwhelming um, uh, response to, to that act really um it brought really the full force of the 21st century at my door so to speak in that um the question about uh history as certainty i don't and i, I know i sound probably a bit obscure when i say that but um that somehow this 19th century curated narrative about you know this is what we value this is what we know this is good this is certain the past is somehow certain and i think for me what's occurred in this past two years is that actually the you know the, by the toppling of colston the past actually can be changed because i mean it's painful and it creates enormous amount of, of anxiety and you know people sit on very kind of opposing positions one might say but we we maybe have to change our understanding about history itself as being this one narrative that's certain and that actually there are other narratives that are inside that large-scale narratives that need to be looked at and need to be looked at in a quite a, uh, in quite a you know straightforward uh, way uh, and 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 we have to live with the anxiety that comes with that and one of the things for me about working with um, the question of spontaneity is that it is always about there is a nervousness but there can be enormous rewards about facing that anxiety about what we thought was the certain the certainty of the past and that actually these other voices and those other voices are going to continue to keep coming round and saying well actually wait a minute there's another side to this what can i add to that i mean obviously i um i live in the uk so i'm fully aware of what's going on in the uk i'm also kind of fully aware perhaps a bit less but fully aware of what's happening in france it's quite interesting sometimes because I'm always made and asked and, and even unconsciously comparing uh, both situations, um, uh, um, I mean, uh, both politics uh, in both countries, um, and, um, and it's very different. I mean, there is no doubt of that, no doubt of that. And, and for example, to have been chosen me as a French Algerian of Muslim background <laughs> to represent France for the first time in the history of the 
Venice Biennale in the French Pavilion, I'm the first, I, I can't even say non-white, but I mean, we all know what, what it means. And we also know that it created already a polemic from the outset when I was um, nominated. Um, and that told me how much, first of all, yeah, we can be part of history, first of all, and change things. Um, because obviously, for people who don't know, there was a polemic that went on where people didn't want me to represent France. Um, and because of that, I thought, no, actually, I've got to represent France. I've got to represent France because it is the first time and I have so much to say, and, I, I've, and it's my right as a French person to represent France, you know, whatever my background is. So, um, of course, you didn't have, and I, and I was so happy when you were, and when we heard that you um, were going to represent England, and there was a few movements of perhaps tiny polemics going on there, but more attached to the perhaps Manchester project, but as a whole, it was kind of embraced in a way. And for me, that was quite painful to see that I wasn't embraced in the same way than she was. But I all realize that's a difference between France and, and the UK. That doesn't mean that everything is perfect in England, and that doesn't mean that France... I mean, I, I've got to, to say that polemic came from a very tiny, tiny group of people from the art world, probably rich people, so they managed to create some waves. But this wave got, you know, um, stopped you know, practically a month after that. But we, we had this conversation many times in my flat where uh, we were comparing, you know, the reaction to this nomination. Um, and I don't know if I'm responding to your question, but... <laughs> well, you're responding to my last question briefly, which was about the significance of what it means to represent a nation, France and Britain, you know, at this moment, given the history of the Venice Biennale and the Giardini, which are very much around national representation, but also I was struck that actually um, this year is the 140th anniversary of a speech made by Ernst Renan at the Sorbonne when he gave a famous speech called What is a Nation? Mm -hmm. And he reflects on what, is, what makes a nation and, and therefore a sense of nationhood. And he hits upon two things. One is this idea of memories, of kind of collective memory, and the other is about a uh, question about how we live together. And I don't imagine he was thinking of your works when he said that, but I think that there is, uh, there is a, a kind of beauty in those two, two elements of, of his definition of nationhood. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit before we open up to questions about this representing a nation and, and what that means for you as artists? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I mean, continuing on what I just said, it's for me, it's for sure it was important to, to represent France as a French Algerian stroke British uh, artist because, um, because I just thought I've got French nationality, I, I, you know, I'm an artist, I've got plenty of work to show and to make and still to come. So there was no kind of, uh, uh, but I did understand that carrying this and accepting this, this position will make a lot of fights to come. I knew that, I knew, and, and anyway, as I said, from the outset, I had to fight. So, and, and I know it's gonna happen and also, French Pavilion is happening between two of the presidential elections, the first round and the second round. So, you know, I'm expecting, I've already been told there will be most probably a lot of attacks or whatever, you know, because of who I am or who my parents are. Um, and uh, so already when I accepted that, I knew it, was, it wasn't going just to fantastic showing work going at the Venice, that there will be another element which would be kind of a, a connected to resilience and resistance, you know. And I just, but I did think I've got to do it. I just have to open the path for other artists to um, to be uh, representing France again, whatever their origins are. Um, so, um, nation, yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting because I've really moved between three countries, me between Algeria, where I spend a lot of time, France, and England. So, this question of notion, uh, the nation, I mean, is is. It's not, I mean, for me, it's not an issue. In some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm quite 
I'm, I struggle quite a lot when people say to me, you're French, or you're Algerian, or you I, I'd like to be the free of them, you know. I'd like to really, truly be the free of them, but I'm never let to be, because I've got to either say on a CV or in an exhibition that I'm French-Algerian, or French-British, or Algerian-British, or whatever. I, I'm always, you know, we are made always to have to call ourselves something, you know, attached to one country. And, um, and this is a problem, but this is a game to play, I guess, so, you know. I'm playing it for now. <laughs> I like the idea of tri-nationality. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, equally, Zineb should be and could be, you know, representing the UK at the British Pavilion. Uh, and I think that's really important to, to acknowledge that that these, these projections of national identity are particularly, particularly now in the 21st century, but it has been for centuries, we're just coming to terms with it now, is that we have been on the move for a very long time. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about, because you know, of course, Jelaine, you, you sent us some preliminary questions that you might want to ask, and um, you know, this, several things that I was thinking about. One, you know, the, the diaspora pavilion that was at Venice, mm -hmm. Which calls into question the question, you know, the idea of 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 occupying one space, one locality, one nationhood uh, within the within the context of Venice, particularly that there are many diasporas and many artists move between different spaces, and and I think that's probably always been the case. Um, but I, then thinking personally, that uh, it's quite it's quite funny that when I was when I was growing up, I would be asked, oh, where are you from? And I would say, oh, I'm from, I'm from here, I'm from London, or I'm from England or UK. People would say, well, no, 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 really, where are you from? And I'd say, no, I was, I'm actually from here. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm, you know, people are asking me, why are you, why are you representing from here? And this, this, this kind of, um, the, the seeming incongruity of it, I, really interests me, you know, that one, on one, one stage you have to fight to say, I'm here, and then on another platform you're having to say, well, do I disown being here or not because of what, of the baggage that it kind of seemingly, seemingly carries. But the point is that I am from here. You know, my answer often would be, well, I'm from my mum and dad. At the end of the day, that's where I'm from, if you're actually asking me. Um, believing that there was this somewhere else that I belong to. And of course, there is a, there are several geographical places that I also have a connection from. I, wonder, I mean, I do wonder whether the emerging generation feels, feels any of that conflict at all. That it's, you know, as, as, as Zineb was saying, quite happy to be from wanting to, to inhabit several places because there is something really joyful to be gained from that and it's not necessarily um it's not necessarily a challenge to be from several places to have several aspects of uh what one is born into to play with to be part of i think perhaps this is really something to say but um, each pavilion has their own way to choose I know with a French pavilion, for example, you have to have the French nationality. For example, I'm thinking of Switzerland, and a very good friend of mine is representing Switzerland, it's Latifa Akshash, who's French Moroccan living in Switzerland, but doesn't have the Swiss um, nationality. So in the case of the Swiss um, pavilion, they do not ask for this nationality. So I think every pavilion has their own, you know, every country has their own way to choose and to invite the artists. So that's quite interesting that I think Switzerland doesn't mind about the artist not being Swiss in some ways, you know, I mean, having nationality. I know for the French it is a case, I understand for Britain also, no? I'm not sure, but... Sorry? You don't? Okay, so this is great, yeah, but... But, but I did want to add that, you know, one of the things that, you know, in the run-up to the announcement and working with the British Council, that you know, being really careful about who we would have a conversation with as part of that announcement about me being, you know, being chosen to, uh, being commissioned by the British Council. And 
uh, having a long and really good conversation with someone from the Times, talking about my practice, talking about collaboration, improvisation, all of those things. And the moment that the that the announcement comes out, it's almost overtaken by uh, the the Guardian's headline: first black woman to be represented by you know at, at, at Venice by. In a British pavilion and it's almost like it at that point it doesn't matter what I make yeah. I am just black and female yeah. and the first to be and so there was no discussion and still actually in terms of the discussions the the, the media attention it's first black woman to be and it's like but I do do things yeah I had exactly the same thing Le Monde first French Algerian woman well I for one am really excited about what you're both going to do and we have a little time for questions less than i wished but we do have a few minutes for questions we're under very strict instructions i'm on pain of death that no one is allowed to say anything about what's going to actually be in the pavilion so you can't ask any questions about that but you can ask other questions of course does anyone have a question Ah, it's in there. Can we just wait for the microphone? I think a lady is jogging down the aisle <laughs> at great speed to bring you a microphone. Will you just say who you are, please? Oh, Will yes. you ask your question? Oh, yes. So I'm Skinder Hundell. I'm the Director of Arts at British Council. And I'm delighted to see Sonia and Zineb Angeline on this power panel of uh, creativity. And, you know, in, in my past, I certainly have enjoyed working with Zineb and Sonia. In fact, Zineb, you were one of our first major shows when I was at New Art Exchange, and you, we were grateful to Tate um, for purchasing floating coffins. And Sonia, recently we've been doing some amazing projects, and also in Birmingham and Manchester. So it's wonderful to see you on stage. Um, you talked about many things today and I made so many notes, so much amazing language and ideas, concepts. And I, I always think about new generation, you know, who's coming forth and what, what do we observe and how do we learn? And Zineb, you were learning from Sonia as a student and it inspired you to be part of that circle with David Bailey in the room as well. I'm wondering who are you inspiring and who are you watching and who is coming forth that you are also learning and collaborating with that inspire your practice, that revive in a sense and reincarnate your futures and how you then give back. Um, so in, so um, the question is, and I'm giving you time to think because it's kind of, kind of a, a, a big question, is about who is the new generation? Who are you watching and who's exciting you going forward? There are so many yeah. stunning artists emerging that I can't actually do a roll call because it, it, you know, we could be here for another hour. There is a really vibrant, very, you know, there's just some stunning work that's being made. I mean, I do have my own particular uh, eye on things that are kind of performative and are collaborative and um, work with new media because that's, you know, I'm kind of, I'm inclined towards that. But across, across media, there is some stunning work and some stunning dialogues that are happening. Um, and I do think that there is, you know, I, I don't want to make some kind of big banner statement, but yeah, really there is so much happening here in the UK that's having, a, having transnational dialogues at the same time. It's a really exciting moment and I'm just like, you know, I think we often, and I, I'm not, I'm not here trying to um, play down what happens in America. But often people look straight to uh, to what's happening in the U.S. But there is some stunning work happening in the U.K. Looking through uh, across the world, and some great curators emerging. There's a lot of right. I mean, Janine mentioned. You know, there's a lot more that's being written. There's a lot of shows being put together. There's a lot of kind of, um, yeah, just get up and go and do. Um, so I can't give you a roll call, but I I can genuinely say there is some fast, fantastic work happening at the moment, and uh, actually increasing. They look younger and younger, but that's because I'm getting older and older. 
I mean, I will agree with, with Sonia. I can't really give any names now um, because I do believe also um, that there is a hell of a lot of good stuff going on at the moment. And also, I spend a lot of time in Paris now and I see a lot of amazing things by uh, you know, young French artists. Um, <clears throat> but I always had, uh, and for the last 12 years, perhaps I had a particular interest to the Algerian art scene because I've, I've created a residency project in Algiers. And, uh, and it's true that I have, uh, you know, I keep a good eye on what's happening, what's coming from there, or what's happening within the diaspora, the Algerian diaspora. Uh, and I, yeah, I think there are some really good things, sometimes some unexpected things. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, that I don't know if they're learning from us or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, probably a little bit, probably not. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, to be artists like us also, and to be able, I mean, before COVID, to be able to travel internationally in the way we did, we see some amazing, amazing stuff. And often it's very difficult even to grab the name of this or this artist, but then they keep coming back, the same artists keep showing. And then suddenly you're like, yes, you know. So um, I can't really add more to that. Any other questions? Has a gentleman at the back there. Please, could you say your name? Yeah, it's Tim Marlowe um, from the Design Museum. Um, Sonia, uh, I know you can't tell us what you're going to do, and you've both been very clear about that, which is quite teasing. We quite like that. But can you give us a sense of whether you both feel you have license to collaborate, and whether there will be a, an explicit dialogue or connection between the two pavilions? Or is there just a serendipity that you're both working on commissions and because of your history and that which you just shared with us, there will be connections anyway? How explicit will that conversation be? There will be connections. It, uh, it, it has to be said that Zineb and I lived next door to each other uh, in Brixton, and we will be living next door to each other in terms of the pavilion. And I think that, 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 that you know, maybe we, need to, maybe we need to do a little kind of tunnel between the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, when, when we realised that we'd be, you know, showing in Venice together and next door to each other on the top of that, I was saying to um, Sonia, it'd be nice if we could build a bridge <laughs> that goes from the French pavilion, or a tunnel for that matter. Um, and I did, I must say, I, I honestly did think of finding a way to do even a little gesture, a little thing between, because I understood that Sonia wanted to do her own project and I had also my own. But we were, and we did have a few dinners at home where we thought, how can we possibly do something? So who knows? You might see something or not. <laughs> it could be symbiotic, it could be structural, or it could be collaborative. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Absolutely no border guards, no control, no migration control. Any other questions? Have time for one more? Please say who you are. Hello, um, it's Sopake Angiyama, Artistic Director at Innova. Um, I just wanted to ask a slightly controversial question. Um, given the fact that you have um, kind of talked about some of the problematics of nation and nationhood, um, do we see that this idea of having a national pavilion is something that you think uh, is a useful model for representing ideas and practice? Well, I don't think it's really <laughs> a useful model, but we've accepted to play the game. Um, I mean... Venice Biennale is what, 150 years old, if not more than that, so it's been like that. Uh, and every pavilion now shows sh their own model in order to break those barriers of nation. I mean, some do group shows with you know, more than two, three artists, others decide to do like solo shows. Um, yes, it's a bit strange. I must say that for me it's a bit strange to be in a pavilion that say French when I feel I'm so British and so Algerian also. But I am also French. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, it's a model that at one point, perhaps in time, uh, this nation building will be mixing. And I, was it two years ago that Henri Sala exchanged the French pavilion with a German one? Was it? Yeah? So there are some kind of really interesting gestures that some artists are trying to do to kind of uh, 
break this, um, this ideas yeah, around the, the nation, the, the pavilion itself? Um, I mean, there's several things here. Um, and really good to see you, Sifake, by the way. Um, I, I suppose part of what I've thought about in terms of uh, this question of pavilions is, is it the same model as the Olympics? You know, where you have you know, various nations competing against each other. Um, and do we ask that question of the Olympics? Why are, why are the competitors in kind of national lanes? When clearly, of course, it's an anachronism. Of course, this, the other thing is that um, we are existing in an incredibly challenging time around the question of nation and nationhood, whether that be here in the UK, um, but across the world in terms of the, you know, people migrating, sometimes forced, sometimes chosen. So it becomes, you know, it, it does become a political question, but I'm not sure, I mean, I, obviously I can't try and solve it in this brief moment that we have here, but of course these things are really incredibly complex. What does nation mean when there is forced migration? People are being let in, people aren't being let in, people are you know, dying at the shores. So of course it's really, it is compromised, but it also is questioned. The Diaspora Pavilion was specifically about, well, what does nation mean when many nations have diasporas? What do we then make, how do we, and so we're working through this, but it's not something that can be answered by one or two um, pavilion moments. It's, what, it's, it's an ongoing question that we're all, we're all having to grapple with and figure out what, you know, and I'm not sure I have a hard and fast position, but I understand that it's, compl it's complex. I don't know whether that helps or answers it doesn't it doesn't make me say yes or no it makes me say yeah it's complicated mm. i mean perhaps uh, what's also is very problematic for me it's this idea of competi competition that comes with i mean i must say I, I didn't think of it like that when i said yes you know i didn't think i i might get the golden lion or not it, it didn't even cross but i can see now the pressure coming up from where we have to be the best you know and i'm like oh so this is, um, yeah, it's like, which is the best country, you know, the best artist. A Killian member has just published a book of essays called Necropolitics, and it's, it's a deeply troubling book about borders and um, death and, and the state of, the, of a world. But there's an opening, a chink of light in it, where he says, why don't we just imagine you know, a world where actually it doesn't matter where you were born and you can go anywhere. So I see your uh, commissioning to be representative of France and Britain, this conversation and collaboration between the Institut Francais and the British Council, perhaps the beginning of a shift where we can move away from nationhood and this question of where you come from and where you belong to is, is no longer relevant. Thank you so much, Sonia and Zina. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed to the three of you. And it was like heartening to see uh, so many people today joining us for this conversation. It's always a risky bet to organize something in the, in, in the morning, but seeing so, much, so many of you today was really heartening. And I, I would like to thank Sonia, Zinem, uh, dear Jilaine as well for chairing this conversation in a magnificent uh, way. And I'm glad that you brought up uh, Ernest Renan because indeed he spoke of memory. And, and Sonia, you touched upon the, the thing that memory is fragile, memory can change can be rewritten, rewritten. Uh, and, but Renan was all, also, as you mentioned, about you know, what we are, our identity, is something to be written. It's something that we keep writing every day. And with you, Sonia, with you, Zineb, we are writing this kind of uh, narrative all, all together, and that's, and that's very... I'm glad also that you brought up Henri Salah, 
because in 2013, he represented France at the Biennial uh, in Venice, being an Albanian citizen. Uh, and so it, I think it speaks volumes also about the, the, the things that you know, the, Bien the Biennial is about. We would like to thank Fries for the, making also this event uh, possible, and in particular Eva Langray. Uh, I would like to thank all our partners, uh, the British Council, uh, with whom we, uh, we are very happy to collaborate today, and with whom we are very happy to collaborate in the framework of uh, Fluxus Arts Project. I'd like to mention all our, also the patrons, all our, our, our supporters of uh, Fluxus Art Projects. Uh, Catherine, dear Catherine, our chair, is here with us today. Thank you very much, uh, dear, dear Catherine. And Fluxus Art Projects has been supported in the past, uh, Dineb uh, and, and Sonia, uh, and, and, so, and will continue to support many, many uh, British and French artists. By British and French artists, we mean people who are actually based in France or in Britain, to, <laughs> to be clear. Uh, and, and thanks also to all our public partners, the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of French Ministry of uh, European and, 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 and Foreign Affairs. Um, now we've been fed with many, many um, uh, spiritual uh, food, uh, and I invite you to join us for a cocktail in, uh, in our listed uh, library for like a more nourriture terrestre for terrestrial food. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.